afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Center for Critical Thinking. We're so happy to have everybody here today, and especially uh, regarding this important topic of the mounting student debt of uh, over $1.7 trillion. And how did we get here? What do we do with it? And where do we go from there? And uh, we are introducing Dr. Gerald LaMarche, who is our very accomplished speaker, and we're so fortunate to have him here today. And we've had so many wonderful topics in the past, and uh, this is going to be uh, another incredibly important topic to be discussed today. And in general, um, well, we are going to be um, taking questions after Dr. LaMarche gives his presentation. And at the bottom of your screen, um, we look forward to your participation and sending in your questions on the Q&A button. And you press that and type away your question and I will get them and uh, hopefully get them, uh, or repeat them as received after the presentation with Dr. LaMarche. And with that, uh, I will introduce to you Dr. Joel LaMarche with his bio. Uh, two days after graduation from the high school vocational education program, he shouldered his Boy Scout sleeping bag and backpack, went to the edge of town and stuck out his thumb heading west, the first of many hitchhikes. Returning to a factory job, which ended with a bump due to a lack of seniority and with few other options, going to the university held some promise, even though there was little thought given to the lack of preparation for undertaking such activity or knowledge of a desired program of study. After much anguish and doubt from changing majors four times, a degree in liberal arts studies and communication was awarded. In time, graduate study became available with studies and degrees in communication, humanities, behavioral science, fine arts, curriculum development, and instructional design. The education allowed for the opportunity to play a part in interesting and diverse employment and the assignments such as multiple academic appointments, research for profiles and courage at MBC, consultant with the Ministry of Education of Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago and the creation of a national college, vice chairman of the board of a bank, member of the board of a residential center for awards of the court and abandoned children, and a trustee of the American Institute for Economic Research. Education is a lot like hitchhiking in that getting there is the better part of arriving. Sometimes one just needs to stick out their thumb and see where it takes them. If you received a degree and did not walk away with a sense of skepticism, some ability with comparative analysis and a dash of creative and critical thinking, then you need to call your college and request a refund. Jerry held academic rank at five colleges and universities over a career of 40 years. He retired from the State University of New York Monroe campus as Emeritus Professor in 2007. He's an Emeritus Board Member of the Center for Critical Thinking. And we are so fortunate to have him as a part of our group and here to speak to us on this mounting student debt. And with that, I hand you Dr. Gerald LaMarche. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you Tammy. I, I, uh, I think I sound better on paper than I do in person. But thank you. Oh, I don't know. You impress me both ways. <laughs> uh, this is a, a very timely to topic, but when you put it in, uh, in relationship to all of the things that we're burdened with right now, the plague, the political conflict, social uh, chaos, um, these are things, some of them will pass, some of them will reinvent themselves and, and revisit us from time to time. For those uh, individuals considering higher education, it has very, very long-term consequences because student debt is something that requires serious evaluation because that will impact uh, your life um, and will be there uh, for many, many years to come. Since there are probably a few students uh, on this, uh, this session this afternoon, this is maybe more important for parents. And, uh, and, and these days, I, I think it's probably equally important for grandparents because more and more grandparents are being asked to participate in funding the education uh, of their grandchildren. Um, 
That's important because the kind of decisions that are made uh, having to do with funding higher education will have an impact on, on the lives of people for up to uh, between 25 and 40 years. And that's a, that's a long time. If you make an investment for four years and you're still paying for it in 25 to 40 years, and there needs to be some serious thought given to this. I'd like to take a moment here and spend a, a minute or two talking about uh, uh, the extent of debt that's part of all of our lives right now. There's a lot of debt around and we need to factor that amount of debt into any future planning for future expenditures that we make, certainly for students who are going forward. In terms of student debt for higher education, as Tammy mentioned, we're talking about student debt of 1.7 trillion seems to be the current figure. And that's just an awesome number. It's a number that's almost beyond uh, comprehension. Currently the United States federal debt alone, just by itself is nearly $3 trillion uh, with Congress about to approve uh, 1.9 trillion uh, for, to, to address uh, the plague, plague issue and a proposal for another two to three trillion for infrastructure. We're talking about money that's almost impossible uh, for any of us to imagine and how that plays a part in, in our lives, but it does. In addition to those numbers, we need to take in consideration that the interest on the current debt this year, just the interest, is going to be about 500 billion, that's a B as opposed to a T, uh, dollars. And we have the possibility of uh, a deficit, deficit being spending more than we take in of, of about uh, 3.3 trillion, maybe more. I don't really have a solid figure on that. And I don't know that, that any of the government agencies do either. This year, the government projects that they will have an income of 3.5 trillion. So if you project that they're going to have an, uh, an expense above and beyond that of 3.3, that, that get, that's to be uh, pretty frightening. Currently, the American national debt is estimated at about $82 trillion. And when I say the national debt, that includes all the debt, household debt, mortgages, corporate debt uh, that we would find for the entire uh, United States, $80, $82 trillion. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund estimate that the world debt is about $280 trillion, $280 trillion for the whole world. And if you look at our debt, just the debt of the United States, that means that the United States is carrying about 29% of all the debt there is in the world. In addition to the US government has liabilities between now and 2050, of about $100 trillion. And I don't know how you fathom that, but that would be uh, for government guarantees, pensions uh, for government employees, insurance for government employees, uh, veterans benefits, and guarantees for loans that have uh, the government underwrites. I know those numbers are, are awesome. So when you look at the 1.7 trillion, that doesn't look so radical, except for the fact that if you're the student and you took that to participate in that loan, that's the money that you have to pay back. My, uh, my father always said that, that economics starts in the kitchen and uh, at, at the kitchen table. Uh, and that's where I'm sitting. I'm sitting in our little alcove here at the kitchen table. So I'm going to pretend that all of you are also sitting at your kitchen table and we're just gonna have a sort of a kitchen table uh, discussion here. Um, Mom and dad, every, every Sunday night, um, he, and Mom and dad would sit down at the kitchen table every other, every other Sunday night after they had gotten their paychecks and made deposits at the, at the bank. 
And after my sister and brother and I had gone to bed, they would sit there uh, with cash and they'd have little envelopes sitting there and, that, and they would divide the money up and put money in those envelopes, so much for food, so much for gas, so much for clothes, so much for church, so much for allowances and for other things for the home. If during those two weeks they used up any of the money that were in one of the envelopes, they had a choice. They could stop spending for that particular envelope or they could borrow from uh, one of the other envelopes, which means that it may run short. But that's the way they ran their household and that's the way they planned their budget. I think the envelope system was probably something that maybe you used in your home, but it certainly might have been something that your parents used in their home. Mom and dad had three children. Mom was a second grade teacher and dad did cost analysis for an oil company. So when they figured their budgets, they figured not only for the two weeks that we were gonna live, but they also projected what they were gonna need uh, in the future. So what I'm suggesting is we all pull up uh, our chairs at the kitchen table here and start taking a look at higher education economics. The cost of a college or university education has increased 55% since 2008. That's a little over 4% a year and that's higher than the National Consumer Price Index. And for those students who are, are thinking about going to school and they look at, at their expenses, they need to be realistic about where they're going to go and where that money is going to come from, not only while they're in school, but when they get out of school. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and these are these are examples of people who I know. Um, shortly before I retired, I was in a, um, a staff meeting, and a, a member of the staff came in, and she was all dressed up, and she was very peppy and and very happy. And we said, "What's the occasion?" And she said, "My husband's taking me out to dinner tonight. And we're going to a really nice place." And we said, oh, is it your birthday or the anniversary? And she said, no, last night I wrote the last check for, for my college loans. Now this lady was 48 years old. Um, she said, I'm so excited to have this done. I've known her for and worked with her for a long time. Um, and she said, I have a three month reprieve here before I start paying off my daughter's loans. We all just kind of sat there and one of the people at the table said, well, why didn't you, uh, why didn't you start saving for your daughter's college? And she said, well, that was almost impossible. I, um, you know, my, when I got out of school and the uh, husband and I got married, I had to, you know, use uh, part of my pay to pay off the wedding. Plus I had my own college loans. In addition to that, we wanted to buy a house. So part of the money went to help pay the mortgage. And then I had to have a car so I could come to work. Now at 48, she had been paying her loans for 23 years. And she was about to start paying her daughter's college loans because her daughter did not earn enough money in order to participate in paying down the loan. And if she carried that out through uh, the entire loan for her daughter, she would be 71 years old before she paid that off. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, last year, I was at, uh, at the swimming pool and one of my neighbors was there and he was telling me about a conversation that he'd had with his son uh, uh, over the week, his son had called him and said that his daughter, which he had two, uh, had just been accepted to the college that she wanted to go to. And the son was asking the father uh, for $30,000. And uh, the grandfather said, or the father said, well, okay, well, $30,000, uh, 
uh, let me talk to your mother and well, I'll, I'll let you know during the week. So he chatted with his wife and they decided, uh, yeah, they could probably um, loan, loan him $30,000. So he called his son back and said, we can do that. How much of the $30,000 do you need this year? And the son said, well, dad, I, I, I need it all. And, and the grandpa says, well, what do you mean you need it all? I mean, if you only need, you need $30,000, but why do you need it all? And he said, well, that's, that's the cost uh, for this year. One year is $30,000. And grandpa was just spellbound. He said, $30,000 is what I spent to send you and your sister through four years of college. He just shook his head and said, there's no way that I could participate in this. I might be able to help a little bit, but I can't give you $30,000 a year. I have not only your other daughter, but I have grandchildren with, my, with your sister. Third story. Um, two years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and I was having uh, uh, to see my daughter and her husband. And, uh, they had invited uh, some of their friends over and they were going to have a little uh, dinner together. And, and they had this couple, that, a young couple their age that I had uh, met uh, in the past, a uh, delightful couple, and was sitting there and the husband was saying, well, uh, Jerry, I understand you're retired. And I said, yes, now do you like it? I, I, that's fine. And he says, well, what's the big difference? And I, I don't have to get up in the morning. I don't have any papers to grade. Uh, I don't have any exams to grade, um, um, and that's it. He says, and the other thing is, is that, you know, I don't get a paycheck every two weeks. So you need to take a look at, when you're retired, you need to take a look at money in a little bit different way. And he said, you know, my wife and I were talking the other day, how much money do you think we're gonna have to have when we retire? And I said, well, that's fairly easy to, um, to make an estimate on, are you planning on maintaining the lifestyle that you have now? And they said, well, yeah, we, we live as well we now, and we hope we'll be leaving, living better. And I said, well, okay. Uh, how much do you think we'd have to have? And I said, well, when you retire, uh, you're gonna have to have about $2 million worth of assets. And all of a sudden the room got very, very quiet. And the wife came over and she said, well, that's impossible. And I said, why? And she says, well, we can't even get a loan to buy a house and we want to start a family. And I said, well, why can't? Why can't you get a mortgage? She says, because we have student loans. Now, they're in their mid thirties. She has a PhD from Johns Hopkins in uh, microbiology. He has an MBA from Wharton School. Between the two of them, they have an income they disclose of $180,000 a year, and they can't get a mortgage. I said, I, I, I find that very strange. And they said, well, um, we owe, we still have student debt of $120,000. So nobody's going to loan us any money. And we've been paying on our loans now for about six or seven years, and they still owe $120,000. My story has to do with a young lady that was a waitress at a restaurant that uh, we used to go to frequently. And she was delightful. And uh, one night uh, we got in there late and she waited on us, but then she was sitting at another table and she was reading and taking notes. And when she came back and we said, oh, are you a student? She says, yeah, I'm, I'm a student. I've got another year to go, but then I'll be done. And I want to be a teacher. And it's fine. So, We've been in there several times and would ask, how's she doing? And she says, I'm doing fine. It's taken me a little longer than I had planned. So about a year or a year or so went by and we went in and saw and she waited on us. And she said, I graduated. We congratulated her and she says, I'm so happy and I've, I've gotten a job. I'm going to be in the city school district. I, I wanted to teach in high school, but I want to teach in junior high. But in order for me to move to the high school, I have to have a master's degree. And we said, well, you know, you can work on that. And, and um, she said, well, it's going to be hard to do because I have to pay on my loan. So we said, well, one of the advantages will be 
um, you can at least have some social life. She says, I haven't had any social life. I've had two dates in three years. Um, but um, I, I won't, I won't be able to start on the master's degree till next summer. So I'm going to work here two nights a week and I'm going to work here on the weekend so I can save the money so I can take two courses each summer uh, for five years to get my master's degree and then I'll be able to teach in the high school. This young woman, because it took her six years to get through her bachelor's degree, will be nearly 30 when she finished and she'll still be sitting there with this huge amount of debt. Um, this last story is really disturbing. Now, on the campus where I taught, uh, junior faculty members, those that had never uh, taught before, were assigned to a senior faculty member to mentor them through their experience. And I had a delightful young man who I had been with for three years. And uh, he came and knocked on the door one day and said, Jerry, I, got a, I, I don't know what to do. I have this student. I'm really, I really, I don't know how to deal with it. I said, well, what's the problem? He says, well, he has such a sour attitude and he's really negative about everything that goes on. And now he's started skipping classes, but I know he's on campus because I've seen him in the hallway. I just, he's just pretty spotty about his attendance in my class. Uh, um, and he says, the reason why he is, uh, you know, has such a negative attitude is he should be at a better school. He would be a better student if he was a better university. And we said, well, what does he mean by that? He said, well, he should have been at Syracuse at the Newhouse School, um, which is a, a great school, but he couldn't go there because his parents didn't save any money. They spent their money at the country club. But if he went to a better school, he'd make better grades. Now, I don't know how you factor that out. I, I'm not even quite sure how you deal with the student and say, you know, if you're, if you're not a good student, period, being at a more expensive school is not gonna improve your GPA. Um, taking those, those scenarios and putting them together because I think they're typical uh, of a lot of uh, the conditions that, that many students find them in both when they're going to school and certainly sets the stage for what's going to happen when they get out. Um, if we look at the players in this scenario, we've got the students and their parents, we've got the lenders who lend the money to go to school, we've got the colleges and the universities, and we got the government. Now the government has been in the education business for a very, very long time. And the first time that I'm aware of goes back to 1860 when Abraham Lincoln established the land grant colleges. And most of those land grant colleges were um, in the greater uh, Midwest. And certainly the, uh, the graduates of school from, the, uh, from colleges from the Eastern schools might've funded the, the Industrial Revolution and the Westbury expansion, but it was the land grant colleges, those students who graduated from there in the engineering and the agricultural schools, which actually built um, the Western movement and the Industrial Revolution because they had graduates that did that. One of the problems, uh, let's take a little, little look at the, at the government role in this because um, they cause a, a, a part of the problem. It was nice of them to make the money available, but for many years, they made the money available through uh, an extended system. The government, in fact, doesn't have any money. They have to borrow money and they borrow it through the Federal Reserve or other uh, people who are willing to buy their debt of uh, foreign countries or uh, uh, other institutions but they create the debt and then they, the, the money that they um, are able to borrow, they facilitated through the banking network and, and other institutions that loan money. For that, uh, everybody came out pretty well. The students got the money they needed. Certainly the colleges and universities got the money that they needed and maybe the money got paid back. The only problem is, is that those amounts that were due didn't always get paid back. 
uh, students would uh, were able to go bankrupt. And the funny thing is about this is that the students who are probably going to be the biggest earners who borrowed the money were the ones who uh, took the bankruptcy. Law students and medical students came out with huge debts. And because they too could declare bankruptcy, they did. Now, the government has done a great deal of work in terms of loans, certainly uh, the GI Bill. Um, Bernie Turner, the founder of this organization, uh, went to university because of the GI Bill. Uh, I think probably the parents of many of the people that are on this um, program uh, this afternoon, if they went to school, um, men, had, if they were in the military, had the advantage of using the GI Bill. A second gift that came from the government was the National Defense Educational Act. And uh, uh, Chuck Kupchella last uh, week when he, when he was doing a program on education, uh, talked about the National Defense Education Act and it was good for him and I have to admit it was good for me. Other uh, avenues for funds have come from state grants, um, and guaranteed loans, uh, I know in, in the state of New York, if uh, you graduated from a New York uh, state high school, you may have been eligible for uh, a region scholarship, which was a, a gift in itself. And I know there are other sources for that money. The problem was is that the government saw, the federal government saw that so many of these funds were not being paid back. Uh, that it was costing them a considerable amount of money and there was serious concern in the legislature about this. And so they came up with a new system and they changed the funding mechanism in 2017 in which the loans were made by the government for those people who could qualify uh, directly to the recipient and they paid the college or university. Now, the qualifications for that uh, I, I, they're variable. They had uh, all kinds of different kinds of criteria. Um, uh, but in, in reality, it boiled down to if you could fill out the forms and you were still breathing, you were probably going to get the loan. And those loans could be recast for uh, different amounts of money. Students who took those loans uh, in the last couple of years, if you went to a, a public college, and graduated with a debt of around, um, oh, about $26,000. If you went to a large public university, the price was a little higher, somewhere between thirty dollars and 36000 If you went to a private college, a uh, small college, it was between forty dollars and 50000 And if you went to one of the elite schools, you're looking at debts that anywhere from sixty to as much as a couple hundred thousand dollars. The minimum payback on most of these loans was about $400 a month. So, and you have to start paying back uh, six months after you graduate and there is no provision for you to declare bankruptcy. So a, a student who may have started college and was there for a couple of years and for other, whatever reason, dropped out and, and, and didn't return, had to start paying uh, at, at within six months. Currently, the, the, the delinquency rate on these loans is about 23%. That's huge. And the default rate, those people who just have just stopped paying is about 15%. And it takes usually somewhere between 20 and for some people as much as 40 years to pay back their loans. Now, all of this needs to be addressed much earlier in the game. There's a thing that if, you, um, if you're a business major and you, you take your first business course, you, you run into something that's caused, uh, called a cost benefit analysis. They'll introduce that the first semester, but they don't explain it to you to the second semester. This is a course that should be taken by students starting in junior high, cost benefit. 
you can apply that every day. In fact, in talking about the cost and the benefit, I would reverse it and talk about the benefit and then apply it to the cost. Because that's an analysis that you can do through your entire life. And if people use that, they would have much less difficulty with their financial issues. I think people um, get hustled into, um, into going to college. And uh, one of the things that um, and we get hustled about is that uh, they tell you, or you can read about it all the time. In fact, if you read the, um, the suggested uh, articles that were attached to this, uh, to this program, if you read those in advance, they make reference to it where they say, if you, if you don't finish high school, uh, you may be deficient by this much, but if you finish high school, you could make this much more and uh, then if you go on to college and you're a college graduate, if you have two years, you're gonna increase by this much, your four year degree, so much more. And if you have a graduate or professional degree, the world's the limit by, by the amount that you can make. I have always uh, thought of that more in the, in the terms of advertising, because when you look at the amount of debt that people incur in order to go to school, they don't ever factor in the number of what the interest on that debt is. And when you put, attach the interest of what you're gonna have on that loan that you cannot declare bankruptcy on, you have paid for that education about one and a half times. It's not different than if you got a car loan or a house mortgage, when you factor in the interest uh, that really increases uh, the amount of cash flow out of your pocket. Um, one of the things that, that, that we don't ever talk about, I mean, certainly you don't hear it from college people and you're not gonna hear it from the people who give you the loans is what is the effect on your life after you've gotten out of college? And there's a lot of data now that, uh, that supports the effect of that student debt and, and what it means to you and to, and to how you move forward in your life. Uh, people who graduate that have huge amount of student debt uh, end up marrying later. Uh, instead of marrying in their 20s, uh, frequently they're not getting married until uh, they're early or, or mid, uh, uh, mid 30s. As a result, they start families a lot later. If you go back to that, uh, uh, that young couple that we were talking about, they were in their uh, mid thirties and they wanted to start a family, but they wanted to buy a house first. And well, she was 36. And by the time they got around to getting a mortgage, she's the one with the PhD in uh, biology. The clock was ticking for her. They hadn't factored that in. Um, graduates that have that kind of debt have great difficulty getting a, a mortgage or purchasing a home. It's just delayed for them. And uh, we've all heard the stories and read it in the paper and it's kind of become a joke now about the number of students who are college graduates who move back home to be with their parents. These are things that are both social and economic costs. And none of that is ever taken into consideration. One thing that I think is never mentioned, but it is a factor and it's a haunting factor. And I find it probably the thing that's most disabling is the stress that goes with knowing that you have this huge debt to pay and you're going to have to forestall moving your life forward because of it. Um, currently, 16.5% of US adults of the age 25 to 34 have student debt. That's 34 million citizens in this country that are sitting there looking at that. 
At 1.7 trillion, the average debt would be about $39,000. Unbelievable. Uh, and that's just the, the, the government loans. It doesn't take into consider private loans that students may take from friends or relatives or a private institution. And right now that stands at one, uh, 119 billion, B, billion dollars in addition to the 1.7 trillion. So when we factor in all of these things, and I don't want to diminish the stress part, because if you're sitting there across the table from somebody who you're dating and you're thinking, oh, there's real possibilities here. That's somebody who I'd like to be with for the rest of my life. And you have the little chit chat and you're about to have the proposal and you're sitting there and you start talking about your student debt and you owe $39,000 and so does she. That's not a great place to start for a relationship because you're not really going to be able to start the kind of life that we had, those of us on this program tonight. And even your parents who came out of the depression were even better situation than these young people are. I'd like to talk a little bit about the basics that you need to get into here. Think, parents that think they may have one or more children going to college need to start planning for it the day they're born, not at some other time. And the child is thinking that they want to go to college, they need to sit down with their, the parents need to sit down with the child and be realistic about what they can contribute to that kid's education. They need to ask the, some pretty pointed questions. One, why is it you go to college? I, Back in the days when faculty members used to be the ones who sat and counseled students when they came in to register, I would always ask a student, why do you want to go to college? And 99% of the time I got the same answer. So I can get a better job. That's discouraging. Almost none of them said, so I can have a better life. In addition to that, you need to ask the kid, uh, what do you plan to study? And what do you know about that, that area of study? What do you know about that career? What are your personal goals? Those need to be defined in advance. And then you have the killer question that you ask the student. How much is this going to cost? Because they will have no idea. And when you look at it and you can say, oh, well, the tuition is going to be about this much. Then you got other factors because in addition to the tuition, you've got room and board if you're living off campus someplace. And right now, room and board in most schools, if you're living in the dormitory and eating uh, in the school uh, cafeteria or something, you're looking at a, at a cost of between nine and, and $15,000, depending upon uh, what school you're going to and how, how elegant it is. And that's just the beginning. In addition to tuition, room and board, you've got fees, you have textbooks and textbooks alone will kill you. Depending on what program and if you're in an engineering program or you're in pre-med or anything that any of the science thing, it's not uncommon to have four or $500 worth of textbooks in one year. Uh, in addition to that, you've got your own clothes, your own spending money. Um, transportation, if you're far away from, from your home, do you want to go home on vacation? Do you want to go home for Christmas? Um, those are legitimate questions. You also have to have a computer. So it's not just the tuition, it's the room and board and all, everything else that goes with it. Um, Another thing you need to have is you need to know something about what you're going to major in. If you're looking at a career program, 
it would be very wise to look around and see if that career is still going to exist in five or six years. After you graduate with technology the way it is, that career may be gone. You may not be there at all. So what is your future? Well, the Department of Labor puts out information every year of the projected number of people that are needed in that discipline. I would think that if you're thinking about going to law school, uh, you might want to rethink that. <laughs> and a good test of that would be is look in the yellow pages, how many lawyers are there? There's a lot of competition in that field. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other fields. If you say, well, I think I, I want to go into accounting. That's a stable area. Well, not with technology the way it is. 10 years from now, accountants will be completely different than, than they are today. So you need to ask, what are the opportunities? What are the opportunities for the region where you live? How many jobs open will be? And are you going to need additional training and education after you get your degree? So if you've worked a couple of years, are you going to need to go back? Are you going to need to get some additional, additional work? It's really a, a great, I think, a real question. And the question that doesn't get asked is, life going to be like if I'm working in that field? What's it like to be that person working there? What's my availability in terms of home life? What's my social life going to be? What's upward mobility be, going to be? Parents need to be really very candid with their kids. And the advice that I've given a number of parents is, is so you sit down with them and say, I will not sign a loan for you. And I will not mortgage the house so you can go to school. I know that's painful. And I know parents want every the best for their kids, but it would be foolish for that to do, for the parent to do that, because if the kid goes, and he doesn't have employment that allows him to pay off uh, the debt on his own, you get stuck with the bill. And at that point, you're probably in maybe your mid 50s and you don't have time to prepare for your own retirement. So that's not a wise decision. There is some homework that students need to do. And let me suggest these things. First of all, there are a number of tests or inventories that you can do to, 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 to see where you want to go. I had not the vaguest idea what I was going to do when I got to university. In fact, I don't even know why I was there. It's, that was a question I asked myself for many, many times. But there are aptitude tests, there are interest inventories, and there are personality inventories, all of which should be available to your high school guidance program. And if, you, if your high school doesn't have that, then you can get them privately to say, oh, this is my personality and these are things that fit and this is my aptitude and these are things that I'm really interested in. I may not know that I'm interested in them, but the test will give you some indication that this is a direction you might want to take a look at. And if there's an area that you think you're interested in, then you need to find some people who do that and spend some time with them and tell them what their work is like and what their life is like. Another thing that um, I have suggested to people that aren't, aren't quite sure is you need to say, um, maybe work for a year before you go to college and kind of straighten things out a little bit. Um, are you going to be a full-time student? Are you going to be able to stay home for a while and go to school and maybe transfer someplace else later? Um, and you need to visit the college. And then I'll kind of wrap this up. I'd like to say a little something about going, uh, picking a school. Schools have personalities just like people do. There are fun campuses. There are friendly campuses and there are hard burden, um, burden campuses. And if you walk across the campus and you see the students walking along with their knapsacks on and their heads are down and they're stressed, you might not want to think about going to that school. If you go across the campus and people are friendly and they're happy, 
And those noises you hear in the background is I've got a construction person there working next door. So if you do you hear a little noise there, um, take a look at the campuses. And if you find out that it's uh, primarily a, an institution where the emphasis is on research for the faculty, and you've got a lot of graduate students there, and you're gonna have some graduate students tending the lab classes, et cetera, then you might wanna look around and find a place that's uh, a little more attentive to you. An example, when I got to graduate, when I got to undergraduate school and I took a chemistry class and a biology class, there were 250 people in the lecture. I never once spoke to the lecture. I almost needed um, uh, binoculars to see the guy. And the, the lab courses were taught by a graduate student who was attending, but his pressure was on him because he was trying to finish his graduate degree. Looking at those things, let me close by, by saying that there are certain things that you, know, you need to ask yourself. Certainly the cost benefit analysis is one of them. And then there are four qualities that I think you should have when you're selecting a, a program of study and a school. Uh, one is at, at the end of taking that course and that program of study, will you be able to function? Will you have a, a, a skill set that allows you to function? And will you be able to participate? Can I you? We, we are um, running short on time, um, so and we have a few questions. So if you're able to uh, wrap okay. that up a little quickly. Last, thank you. Two things I'd say are, uh, when you finish your program, are you gonna be able to pros prosper? And, and will you be enriched? Are you, uh, by enriched, I don't mean make more money, but will it enrich your life? Is this gonna make you, uh, uh, give you some gratification as a person? So, Let's entertain some questions if you have some. Well, first of all, Jerry, thank you, or Dr. Lamarche. Um, thank you, and really uh, insightful and interesting and fascinating topic and so many um, wonderful pieces of advice that you have and, and great um, details of facts and figures that you have. And, um, you know, it's so complex and you look at, you know, how can somebody break out of being in lower class? How can they get out of that circle? And, uh, you know, their parents never went to school. School isn't part of their world. You know, they need to have an opportunity at school to, to advance. And, you know, somehow they get saddled with debt and they're not used to that world. And it's such a, a vicious circle. And, uh, you know, it, it, I was looking at some um, things and it says that debt, student debt has doubled from 2010 to 2020 to the 1.7 trillion mm -hmm. despite the overall decrease in annual borrowing and the guaranteed student loans um, from what i'm understanding now is being handled by the department of education mm -hmm. and it's guaranteed so what are your thoughts on how the schools are possibly taking advantage of this opportunity to enhance their their situations. Absolutely. <laughs> when the federal money became available and when state money also come, comes available, uh, colleges and universities are, are hogs at the trough, just like every other business. It's what people don't take into consideration. It's a business and it's, it's, it's not always run like a business is, but it is a business and they're gonna take advantage of every opportunity they can to have the income because they have it's, it's a competitive business. Uh, for those students who come who are, um, do not have resources, um, then, then I think in the last couple of years, schools have become more sensitive to that and there is more state and federal funding available based upon uh, the ability and the background of uh, the student. Uh, but even so, that's not gonna, that's not going to be enough to get them through. I can't tell you the number of students that I had that came from very humble and modest, more than modest backgrounds, very humble backgrounds, and they wanted 
education was for them. They would be working part-time, sometimes two times, two jobs, just trying to get through. Uh, you give the student a textbook because you know if you ask them to buy a $60 textbook, they weren't gonna eat that day. I may not even eat that week. There's maybe what's happening now with the with the change in government, more money will become available for that, those students, but it will, will trickle down. I wouldn't count on colleges and universities facilitating that very much because they have their own needs. The thing you need to take in consideration is many of the small liberal arts colleges that don't have endowments are gonna have a hard time making through this. They've overbuilt, they've overbuilt buildings, they've overbuilt, um, I mean, they have things that actually have no business being there. Uh, they need to get out of the sport business. Um, they need to get out of the entertainment business and get back in learning business. I, I don't have a good answer for you on that, Tammy. Uh, it's, there's just not going to be enough money for those people, no matter how much they want it. And they get discouraged and say, I just can't do this. I well, there seems to be uh, a lot of questions on your opinion of loan forgiveness. And is it fair to the people who have already paid their debt? Is it fair to the people who have taken loans out for their children so that they wouldn't have debt or, you know, those types of scenarios. So what is your opinion on the loan forgiveness that's being discussed out there? Well, for the student, for the student who has the loan, it's a great thing. But what about the person who went out there and worked and wanted to go to school, but couldn't, couldn't, go, couldn't go to school and he's out there with a job and he says, I've already paid for that education because I'm paying state income taxes and I'm already paying for that university, but I can't go, I can't afford to go. Or the people uh, with the mom and dad who saved the money and sent their kid to school and paid the whole freight, or the kid who worked part-time to go and help uh, supplement what his parents could afford and say, I paid for the whole thing. Why is this person getting uh, getting a free ride? Where, why, uh, you know, you hear numbers from anywhere from $50,000 worth of forgiveness to $10,000. It sounds great, but in order to do that, the government again is going to have to borrow the money to to uh, underwrite that expense. Well, then the taxpayer is legitimated to say, "I've already paid for this once. How many times do I have to pay for it?" So there's not a clean and easy answer here. I, yeah, and somebody uh, just wrote a question: um, What is the current interest rate that the the government charges, and what about you know possibly decreasing? Uh, students debt to zero percent interest so that they can pay it off much quicker. Um, I've heard two numbers, four percent and six percent. So that that's my best answer on that. Uh, Which is more expensive than a mortgage. It is. Yeah. In fact, of, of household debt, mortgage is the only thing that is 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 more than student debt. Uh, it's more than credit. Student debt is more uh, is more than credit card debt. That's hard to believe. Yeah. Payments. Um, it's 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 not a kind universe to enter into here when you start talking about that. I, I think uh, I think taxpayers have a, a right to expect um, there to be a level of integrity here. Why should I pay more? Because they've already paid for it the first time. Um, here's another question. State governments have cut their budgets by 30% since 2006. So public higher education has had to raise their costs to survive. The feds, the feds have filled the gap through loans. Um, that's an interesting comment. It also, um, launches from the discussion you and I had yesterday, Jerry, uh, regarding the breakdown of student expenses that the in-state students are charged versus out-of-state students or foreign students and how the universities need those full tuition students, leaving you know, very few slots open for the in-state students to pay the lower rates, which we subsidize. 
So it's uh, it's an unfair arrangement the way they have that set up. A lot of state students pay the full shot. Uh, they pay more. Sometimes they pay twice as much. And foreign students who come, of which there are more foreign students coming all the time, they're really a cash cow for the, for the college uh, and university. They love them because they're paying big bucks uh, to come. Uh, the, the, the strange part of it is, is a lot of the foreign students are much better prepared to be there than the than the normal students, the, the students from the U.S. They come really well prepared. You know, one of the um, comments in here, it says, by the way, the cost of textbooks are plummeting due to the effects of digital books, rentals, and organized used book sales. But I can personally vouch for the opposite. Uh, they charge for the discs that these students can access yeah. these books. And I know my kids are paying, you know, five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars for one book. How can how can they per be permitted to charge these erroneous expenses? It's it's wild. It should be illegal that they get away with that expense. Well, the, the bookstores on a college campus are an income producing place. Uh, the the college. Well, the professors are making off of these books. Absolutely. Quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, it. it just seems to be so unfair to the students. Plus the professors require that you use their textbook and they come out with it exactly. every, every three years. So you can't use the one from the semester before, but it's essentially the same text. Um, yeah. how, how, uh, my friend, my friend and colleague, uh, Vince Rotella and I solved the problem. We both taught the same course and they wanted to have us uh, adopt the new textbooks and we said, I, I told the, the vendor, you raise your price on the textbook one more time and we're gonna drop the text. And he just kind of blew me off. Well, Vince and I went down to the bookstore and bought all the copies that they had, told the bookstore manager that not to reorder them. And he says, well, that's a lot of textbooks every semester and said, yeah, I know. So we took all of the ones we bought. I think totally we had about somewhere between 20 and 25 of them and took them down, put them on the reserve stack in the library. And I just told the students, you don't have to buy the textbook, but you do need to own the information that's in it. Well, the textbook company went bizarre. They ended up calling uh, not only the manager of the bookstore, but uh, ended up calling uh, the dean and the dean called me and I said, here's the deal. Kids can't afford to pay that much. And I told them, I told the publisher, if they did it, we'd drop it. Well, they complained because we put it in the, on the reserve stack. Yeah. You can't walk in there. Oh, <laughs> well, good for you, Sherry. It's uh, commendable because, uh, boy, it seems like the other way around with the professors these days, they want their books to sell. So, um, so Dr. Lamarche, in closing, um, what's the solution? How do we get out of $1.7 trillion in student debt? I don't know that we can crawl out of that. Maybe the government will give some kind of a reprieve or a way that you can uh, deduct your debt uh, above and beyond the interest or, or even if they just did away with not having to pay the interest on the debt would be some reprieve. Uh, or you would be able to deduct a portion of your student debt uh, from from your from your taxes, which may maybe be a more equitable thing for all all parties uh, involved here. Uh, but the universities are going to have to re-examine themselves and rethink what they do. Um, my friend Henry Fugue and I worked for a, a while on uh, designing the three-year degree. Uh, instead of going uh, four years and taking the summer off. Uh, students used to do that and they could earn enough money during the summer to offset their major expenses. Uh, as student working during the summer wouldn't cover two weeks of what college expense is. So if you had a three-year degree, you could cover the same amount of time and learn just as much. Um, maybe all of the elective courses shouldn't be there. There's a whole bunch of curricula that are on college campuses and a number of required uh, we, we, we courses that, that, that maybe just shouldn't be there. Um, 
I, I think it's going to be a hard battle. The other problem at the other end is, is that we have overproduced uh, the number of people that want to have an academic career. Uh, we, we've produced a, a ton, a ton of people that have great qualifications and there's just not positions for them. When I retired and a, a, another colleague retired, we were full, both full profs. Um, they opened up the positions for people to apply. We had uh, about, I think, 115 people applied for entry level instructor positions. They hired one and, and hired three adjuncts. Now they weren't teaching our courses, but they got the entry level courses. And, uh, and that kind of bothered me because my feeling always was the first course you take in a program should be taught by the best professor in the department because that's gonna set the tone for the, the, what, what should be the academic achievement for that student for the rest of the time they're there. Well, it seems like there should be somehow some responsibility on the schools to uh, control the expenses and um, understand certain majors may not be as promising as other majors and the students really should be uh, told these things. So. Well, every, every, yeah. every school should have every program. I mean, I, 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 a friend of mine said to me one time, Elvis didn't go to Juilliard. So does every school need to have a, a music program? Does every school need to have an art program? Does every school need to have uh, a whole range of programs? You say the schools could specialize in certain areas. And if you want to work in that field, fine. Uh, the other thing is, is that student administration, I mean, the administration of the colleges have grown more than the faculties have. There are how many vice presidents, how many deans, assistant deans, mm -hmm. assistant deans, a counseling center. I, I never saw a counselor uh, the whole time I was in a university, uh, except when I went to change majors, which I did frequently, but... <laughs> But I, I, this little lady who was the uh, who was a retired English teacher was hired part time to, to come in and for students who needed to have a signature to change their major. Otherwise, you talk to an upperclassman and say, "What class should I take next, or which one should I take next?" Mm -hmm. Well, I have one uh, closing comment here, and it, uh, this person says, "As a retired professor." who co-wrote the textbooks used in my classes and who made them available for free to my students. I want to remind everybody that not all professors who write textbooks are in it for the money. So we applaud you, whoever that was. Thank you for sending I, that. I bless, you. I bless you, my friend, I bless you. <laughs> oh. Well, Dr. LaMarche, we just can't thank you enough for a very interesting uh, session here and it's so enlightening and disturbing and i don't know that any of us have any good solutions but hopefully uh we can get this under control and new students won't be indebted for the rest of their lives and uh, we thank everybody listening to dr jerry lamarche on uh, our 1.7 trillion dollars debt and uh we have so many other um wonderful presentations uh, coming our way. So please be sure to check your calendars and the emails that come through. And with that, we will see everybody next time. And thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.